Good evening, everyone. It's Education Week. Welcome to a special edition of Spanning the Need. Tonight's episode, we'll be talking about how local schools all over the state of Ohio will be opening up and what precautions they are to take care of our students and our staff this fall. With me tonight is Ron Irusis, superintendent of Marion City Schools and uh, from near Columbus, just outside of Columbus, and Tim Saxton, superintendent, Boardman Local Schools near Youngstown, Ohio. Thank you for joining me, gentlemen. How are you guys? Excellent. Yeah, doing doing well. <laughs> Excellent. Doing well. All yeah. things considered, we're doing okay. Well, Just we again. we talk we talk, we're we got a lot to cover in a short period of time. Uh, Ron, let, let's start with you. You're just outside of Columbus, so what have you guys? Give us a little background about kind of just where you've been and, and how you kind of got to where you are now. Yeah, uh, first, th thanks for having having me on. It's a it's a pleasure to be here, especially alongside with my good friend Tim Saxton, who I had a chance to work with a lot when I was in Mahoning County. So. I've uh, been in Marion now for two years, uh, just just starting the third year here. Uh, spent a lot of time, uh, you know, in in uh, Mahoning Valley as a, the ESC superintendent and career tech center superintendent. You know, had an opportunity to come down to Marion. Um, had, had had we had some experience with Marion when I was the career tech center superintendent. We'd actually partnered on a uh, on a grant together. And so um, when they had a vacancy here, you know, had some conversations. So really, uh, um, really enjoying my time here in Marion. We, uh, it's, a, it's, it's a district, it's an urban district um, that, you know, struggles with some trauma and some poverty and those kinds of things. So it's a lot of good transformation work. And uh, we're, we're really taking some really good steps, I think, in the right direction to help uh, increase our opportunities for our students here in Marion. So. Yeah, just finished up my second year and uh, starting this third year, uh, never, you know, kind of, I don't think anybody ever thought that we'd be faced with a pandemic and the things that we are, you know, the decisions that we're making are something that, you know, we, we're not accustomed to. It's unprecedented. But down here in Marion, too, we have a good network of superintendents and our ESC does a really good job of coordinating conversations. So uh, there's a lot of resources available to us. So uh, I'm thankful and grateful for that. And, and Tim, you, you've been at Boardman, and give us a little bit of background about you. Uh, I'm finishing my fourth year as superintendent. Uh, it's, hard to, it's hard to believe I said that. It's gone pretty quick. Uh, I came to Boardman in uh, 2002 uh, as high school principal. Um, spent 11 years as high school principal, loved it. Uh, and then uh, we, we had a transition plan. Mr. Lazari was superintendent. Um, part of our transition plan was to have me come to the central office. Uh, took the director of operations position for three years, which was great. Learn maintenance, uh, transportation, food services, uh, and the whole operations side. Uh, I did that for three years and got a chance to study under Mr. Lazari. Then I took over uh, as superintendent back in 16. I'm actually a Borman grad, just haven't been here all my life. I did go teach up in Cleveland for uh, at Bedford City Schools for eight years and uh, taught and coached up there. Married my beautiful wife, Gina, and we moved back here to, uh, to uh, the Mahoney Valley to raise our family. And I actually was at Canfield for six years where I coached, taught, and went into administration. So, and uh, just like Ron said, thanks for having us on. It's, uh, I think I'm finally at the point where uh, you feel a little more comfortable talking about plans. I mean, there, there's so many things you, that you just don't know. And um, four weeks ago, it was hard to talk about it, but uh, as we get closer, it just feels like more pieces are falling in place, but there's still a lot of questions. And I think that's what we want to talk about because we are now, right up against the start of fall. Um, I know a lot of schools have moved their schedule to either end of August, beginning of September. And let's, let's go with you, Tim. Tim, we talked a little bit off that you have moved your schedule. Yep. And tell me a little bit about what you've learned over the last three to four weeks and what kind of plan that you're going to have in place uh, for the fall for your students and staff. First, uh, probably the biggest thing we learned is don't don't uh, count on your decision being permanent because there is nothing permanent. We could be talking right now, and when this is over, something could have changed. Um, so that's the one thing you got. You got. You absolutely have to be flexible. You have to be. You cannot be set in stone in any plan. Yeah, you have to be able to evolve. You have to be evolve quickly. You have to think differently. Um, and we wanted to survey our parents. Uh, we wanted to have open and honest uh, dialogue with our staff. And uh, we wanted to plan, you know, number one was safety in mind. And then once we had safety, 
Uh, number two would be make sure the quality where, uh, of education, whatever path was delivered, uh, was top notch and up to the board and community expectations. So we offered several different plans to the board of education. We, we looked at a, a five person. We looked at a hybrid. Uh, you know, we looked at a fully remote and, uh, you know, present all those plans, present the pros and cons, show the survey results. The board blessed a, a five day in person launch with uh, a fully remote option for parents uh, who were not comfortable with the uh, the five day in person model. Now we now, and let's talk about that real quick. And you almost kind of your enrollment is 4,100 kids in the, in yeah. the Boardman local schools. That's correct. Correct. Mm -hmm. So you have multiple buildings to pretty much try to make safe. Absolutely. And they're, uh, uh, and they're all different style. You know, Center Middle School is over, there's parts of Center Middle School over 100 years old. You know, try putting Wi-Fi in a building like that that has uh, plaster and uh, metal mesh in the walls. Um, yeah, so it, every building's a little bit different. We got three elementaries. We have uh, intermediate, junior high, and high school. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's a little different flavor in each building. And, and let's go to you, Ron. Ron, you're you're pretty much almost on the same plan. You're kind of at the two options. Talk a little bit about kind of your uh, challenges and and what you've learned sure. and where you're going. Well, I'm going to go back a ways, back to June, uh, when I was asked to, to kind of serve on a countywide task force, if you will, with some county leaders in the Marion Public Health Department. And so back in June, if you recall, you know, we were – Ohio had kind of done a really good job with flattening the curve. And, and we thought, you know, that we were headed in a, in a good direction. And so our health department said at that, that point that, you know, we should expect to, to, to open up school in the fall full on face to face. And, and, you know, there would be some guidelines to follow and, and to make sure that we were following certain protocols. So, you know, that, and they also recommended at that point that, you know, the virus was still going to probably be here and that we needed to make sure that we provided an option for those families and students that were vulnerable or just really didn't feel comfortable with coming back on that face-to-face. -face. So we spent, you know, pretty much all of June and half of July preparing for that scenario. And so, you know, really the five protocols that we were given is that every student had to have a daily assessment. We had to have hand washing protocols. We had to have daily cleaning protocols. Uh, we had to make sure that kids were at that point, they called it physical distancing because I don't care what anybody says. It's, it's really tough to, dip, to to social distance and say six feet apart, you know, in a traditional setting. Our, our middle school has a thousand kids. So, you know, so to be able to do that was, was difficult, but we were preparing for, you know, making sure that we were physical distancing and kids weren't touching each other. And then we had to come up with a face covering policy at that point. It really wasn't a mandate. Um, but so those are the types of things that we were preparing for. And we introduced to our Board of Education our reopening plan based on that information that we got from the health department. Um, ironically, three days before was our next task force meeting. And at that point, you know, we started to see things, things change not only in Ohio, but across the country as far as the number of cases that, you know, were increasing. And so, you know, um, part of part of the uh, issue with us here in Marion is we actually saw some increases in uh, adolescent cases. So, you know, Children under under the age of eighteen, we had we had somewhat of an increase, not 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 a significant amount, but that was a, an area of concern. So at that point, we were told that we should probably be looking at uh, some kind of hybrid model. And what the hybrid model is all about is the ability to do more social distancing. So if you you know our hybrid model is about fifty percent of our kids being in a building on any given day. So a class size now in an elementary building is probably going to be about ten or eleven, twelve kids as opposed to 24, 25 kids, and we can do a much better job of social distancing and the mass requirements and those types of things. So, um, you know, after we kind of introduced our, our model as being full on, we continued to monitor and have conversations with our health department. And so as of today, we are still planning on opening in the hybrid model. So our kids are grouped in groups A, B, and C, they're grouped alphabetically. Um, groups A will be in on uh, Monday and Tuesday. Groups B will be in on Thursday and Friday. Wednesday will shut down completely for, you know, some really good cleaning and giving our, our uh, teachers an opportunity to really do some planning. And then we have a group C, which is kind of our vulnerable students, students with special needs and, and who really need to be in school. So those, those students will be in four days a week, but typically those students have really smaller class sizes. So again, we're able to social distance with those students. <clears throat> 
And so that's kind of where we're at with our plan. We also pushed our start date back. We were actually scheduled to start on Monday. Uh, and so our official start date for us will be August 31st. And you talk about your hybrid and in-person or your online. What's your percentage to online versus hybrid? Yeah, good question. We have we have uh, 1,200 students that signed up out of our 4,500 uh, for our on, online option. And so we'll, we'll open the year with uh, probably, you know, 20, 25 percent of our students will be online. Uh, now, is that K to 12 or just the high school? No, that's K to 12. So uh, and we've you know assigned a teacher to all of our students that are online. Um, and we're using, you know, a learning platform for it's a little bit different in the elementary as opposed to the middle and high school. But the learning management system also has some content. So our teachers basically are monitoring progress that our kids are, are uh, making with, um, you know, really an online uh, platform. And, and I know, Tim, the deadline for sign up was July 31st, if I'm not correct. It was it, originally. Oh, yeah. it got extended? <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, I mean, we wanted to get stuff out to parents. And so we gave them a, a good framework uh, to make their decision upon. Our mistake was for parents to make a good decision, they need more than a framework. So we filled in uh, some of the details of that framework with the knowledge we had at that time and pushed that date back. So they were actually due last Friday. That was the postmark date. You know, we did get a bunch more. Uh, we're, we're pretty close to that same percent. We're, we probably have about 1,100. So we're probably a little higher, just a little higher percent uh, than Ron, but uh, not quite 30. But uh, we predicted 20 to 25. We're probably somewhere around 26 right now, 27 could grow. Um, if we have any more late entries. Let me ask you this, and this is just a question. Students that are online, and any of you can jump in, will that affect your state funding because they're not actually in the classroom? Okay. No. no. And we were required to have a remote learning plan that we actually have to submit to the Ohio Department of Education. Correct. We still need to meet the hour requirements, and we have to have a plan in place for those students to be able to do that. We have to monitor that. So, you no, know, our, our, uh, our requirements are still intact. And, and here's, a, here's a number for you. The numbers just came out earlier today that out of all the school districts, and we talked a little bit about this, is 325 school districts in the state of Ohio are going to go back full time as of right now. This is as of today, or I would say about a week data. Okay. 55 are online or remote, or and 154 are hybrids a little bit of in-person and a little bit of, of uh, online learning. And that's the sources department of education for the state of Ohio. So that gives a pretty good idea of where people are going. I mean, we just had an announcement that another school district is going all online. So what has changed from when you started to now? I'll, I'll go to Tim. Well, uh, what has changed? We see since we released that initial plan, or correct? Uh, it, it, all the conditions change. Obviously, you see the Cuyahoga County schools, I believe, have have made a move to go to uh, to remote. Um, as you know, a local school uh, not too far away has gone to remote. Um, really, I, I can tell you at, at Borden, what's changing is the more you you put your plan to paper to details, the harder it becomes uh, food services, tremendous hurdle. Uh, obviously your costs are just going through the roof. Uh, we had originally had a budget, I wanna say about 300,000 for PPE and, and other uh, safety devices. We're probably closer to 600,000 now uh, because of plexiglass and other items. And cafeterias gotta take a look at, at food, co uh, food coverings, you know, how to serve students, how not to have kids come down in a con congregate style. Uh, our cafeterias are, are used to packing 300 kids and you can't do that. So you, you got to buy more tables to put other places. So, I mean, you start actually putting the uh, uh, the details to paper and actually thinking what the life of a kid's going to look like and start thinking about the actual logistics and processes when you open up, not the theoretical, um, there's layers. And boy, you just got to start making decisions, uh, you know, about safety, expenses, and I, I, I is this the right choice? So that that's kind of what's changing. It's we're getting closer to pull, pulling that 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 uh, uh, pull the open on, on the first day of school, and you really start thinking about the, the real details. 
And, and I think that talks a little bit about what you guys are going through, how you're just going through money like water. And, and Ron, talk a little bit about what you guys are doing too. Or you're probably in the same boat. Well, you know, the, the unfortunate thing for Marion City is we have a very poor population. We have a high free and reduced lunch. The fortunate thing is we have a poor population and high and free, free and reduced lunch. So we're eligible for, you know, we're probably going to get about $1.6 million in, uh, um, you know, um, CARES Act money and some other, uh, and, and we need it. We really do. I mean, you know, we, uh, our kids really struggled in the spring with remote learning. We had a lot of our students, probably about 25% of our students that really struggled with internet access. They had, they struggled with uh, access to devices. We gave out every single Chromebook that we had in the district available. Um, we are spending $800,000 of that uh, CARES Act money to provide Chromebooks for our students this year, which is a good thing. I mean, we, we, we need to be one-to-one -one and we need to integrate more technology. So we're taking advantage of that. Um, but, you know, most of those dollars are spent, you know, preparing for this year, really, you know, not knowing where we'll end up. You know, maybe we will end up having to be completely remote. And so if all of our hit kids have Chromebooks and they have hotspots now with access to Internet, you know, we're, we're much better prepared than we you, know, you got to remember. I mean, we were given basically four days to prepare for, um, you know, the entire spring when we were notified that schools would be closing. And, you know, I'll, I'll give a lot of credits to superintendents and staffs and teachers across the state of Ohio and across the country who really did a really good job and did the best they could to provide, you know, access to in education during that time. Uh, I feel like we're a little bit more prepared and we have some dollars to be able to do that. But, you know, like Tim said, there's, you know, food service, which typically are, you know, your food service department's really you know, yeah. you're on deficit spending all the time. I mean, you're you're flatlined. You don't have a, a extra dollars to go spend, and you're you know pinching every penny you can with that. And so, you know, the the change in that and 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 bringing on more staff to be able to to help with those kinds of things is is uh, you know part of those financial decisions. And we have to make sure you know we we still still have to sustain our budgets long term. I mean, we we're you know we're going to be here for a couple years, and eventually this is going to dissipate at some point, I hope sooner than later. Um, but we have to make sure we, you know, we, we have a budget in place still that we can sustain once our kids are back. And, and, you know, let me say this too. I mean, I, I'm sure Tim feels the same way. We want our kids back in school. I mean, we know the important, my community, our kids need to be in school. A lot, a big portion of our community, our kids are at risk right now when, you know, when they're home and they don't have school, they don't have a a place to get their food and their safety and their comfort and those kinds of things. So we're going to do everything we can. And once the health department says we're good to go, I mean, we, we will, we're not committed to long-term hybrid or anything like that. Because if our health department, if we're, if our trends continue here in Marion, our health department says we're good to go, we're, we'll be back for long. Well, I think that brings up a great point is, is that how many reduced lunches are in your, in your district, Ron? Well, we're hundred percent free and reduced. So we, I mean, we're a very high poverty district um, and, you know, I mean, the, the, the kids, the, I don't know, you know, the median income in Marion is probably $28,000 per family. So no. almost roughly the same as maybe a, a Youngstown City yeah. Schools. Mm -hmm. and, and Tim, what about you? Uh, a couple things here. Our, our, our free and reduced lunch is uh, low 40s, like 42%, I want to say. Uh, obviously, uh, that, that's probably going to change this year because of uh, the financial uh, climate. Yeah. Um you know, if they talk about uh, Ron and uh, the CARES money he got, he said 1.6 million. Mm -hmm. considered a wealthy district. We got 250 thousand right. dollars. Yeah. So uh, I always say we're property rich. If you drive through Borman, absolutely. If you're going to build a restaurant or a shopping place, you're going to build it in Borman. There's some beautiful houses here, but uh, I would say we're income average. You know, and so that that income piece. Um, that's what hurts us. It, it's not heavily weighted in the funding form, and that can be a whole different. Uh, time spent talking about that. I don't want to get into the weeds on that. <laughs> we'll be uh, here all night. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we, we have, we have, uh, we have a great, great diversity and that's a strength at Boardman. I, I tell new teachers, you're going to be teaching kids in class, a new teacher. Uh, you can have a kid who's, who lives in a $40,000 house and you can have a kid who lives in a $400,000 house. You got to teach them both. And that's the beauty of Boardman. There's strength in that, but uh, um, that's Boardman. Well, and I think that brings up a, a good point is, is, the state even cut everyone's budget uh, 
uh, in I would say May maybe. Yep. And I know Boardman lost. I correct me if I'm wrong. I think about seven to eight hundred thousand dollars. Yep. Is that about right? Yes. And did you lose any, Ron? Yeah, we lost about. We're, we're in that you know in that bottom tier again. So you know all of those cuts were made uh, and they were kind of prorated to where you're at with your free and reduced and your poverty level. So, but we lost about five hundred and fifty thousand, uh, which again you know and people don't realize you know that 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 cut is actually extending through this fiscal year. Now right. it's cut out during the whole year. It's not in one quarter, but it's still, you know, a half a million dollar uh, cut is, is a half a million dollar cut. And so we have, you know, we just can't brush it off and sustain it. Now, you know, we, we did save some money in the spring, you know, we didn't transport students and those kinds of things, but, you know, so we ended up probably with a deficit after all said and done uh, of that 550,000. I think we were a deficit probably about, 200,000 of that. So because we were able to make up some and, you know, no subs, no, no uh, uh, transportation and in in those kinds of things. So um, Tim, same with you pretty much. Yeah. Um, you know, go back to what Ron's saying. Um, obviously you saw savings in fuel and uh, overtime uh, field trips. Um, and we, you know, we had a built a nice built in savings and, and we last summer we closed an elementary, which is a very emotional and passionate thing for a district. And we laughed because we said we can't wait till this summer because we won't be dealing with something like that. And so our head of operations says, Don't you ever say that again. <laughs> but the nice thing is, you know, we, we're seeing about a half million dollar savings. Uh obviously we want to put that into infrastructure because of how old our infrastructure is, mm -hmm. but we're gonna have to put that into PPE and, and, and other safety upgrades. And with the savings we had. So we, I'd say we broke even with that that eight hundred thousand we took out, but uh, you know we're, we're we're spending, and we'll, obviously we'll get some CARES money. Uh, I'm like Ron said, I, I, we say the best investment we can do is technology right now. Uh, we're, we're buying uh, uh, about two thousand Chromebooks. Uh, we should be able to go one to one with our seventh through twelfth graders because mm -hmm. no matter what happens, that's a great investment. Whether you're in person, remote, fully remote, that's a really good investment. I'm not saying plexiglass isn't, but because safety, there's no price we can put on safety. Uh, but maybe uh, a year from now or two years from now, we won't need plexiglass like we need it now, but Chromebooks will always be used. And, and, that, and I've talked to some superintendents and some principals that's saying they have planned to get Chromebooks for people in the next five years, but this just kind of rushed it up, rushed yeah. their plan a little bit where they had a hard time finding money. But like you said, there was savings to find. Right. And you probably have a hard time right now finding Chromebooks. You know, uh, something you asked, I, I probably didn't answer uh, in, in much depth, was that, that two-week delay. Uh, there, there's multiple reasons. One is uh, to get all our materials in, get them in place, get everything set up, and make sure it is ready to go. So we wanted to buy some time. That, that was number one. Num number two was uh, we wanted to make sure our teachers were absolutely uh, prepared for remote and the dual platform, the in-person and the remote learning. because our teachers are gonna end up doing both. And we wanna make sure that they're ready to go at all the professional development. Um, so we felt that two weeks. And the other issue we have, Center Middle School over hundred years old, third floor. Um, last year, we, there was temperatures above 95 degrees in some of those classrooms. I can tell you, you put a mask on outside, even here in Ohio for, for a half hour, 95 degree weather, it's not gonna work. I can't put kids in masks in a, in a classroom that's 95 degrees uh, for a school day. So we probably would have to shut buildings down uh, in those first two weeks of September. We're hoping that second half of September, you get the cooler nights, you, you get that hot air out during the night, bring that cooler air in the morning. So when teachers come in, it's very cool in the room. All those bodies do warm it up, by, but by the end of the day, it's, it, it's, it's still pretty bearable. But you start in September or August and you have those warm nights, you can't turn that air over temperature-wise. You can turn over freshness-wise, but you can't get that hot air out and get that cool night air in. And that's a very, very old building. Yes. Yeah. Great. Building. Very well maintained. And, uh, but uh, we're getting everything we can out of it. Well, let me, let me talk. Let, let's talk, Tim. Let's go further. What should kids, parents, and staff expect when they come the first day of school? Well, if they they're coming in to learn. If they're coming in person, it, it, things will be, absolutely be different. You, you got you to throw away your old routines. Uh, we're not going to line uh, 15 buses up in a parking lot and then teachers come out and, and all 15 buses release. Not going to do that. Buses will drop off as they come in. You know, kids, uh, there'll be markings in a hallway, which side of the hallway to go on. Uh, 
kids will be reporting directly to classrooms. Uh, obviously, uh, parents, we're expecting parents to go through a whole protocol before they put a kid on the bus or bring them to school. And that includes, you know, temperature checks and symptom checks. You know, that's that trust piece. Everything we build is built on trust. That, that, that's that, that fundamental uh, cement that's gluing the whole foundation of our plans together. So we got to trust parents are going to do their part. Parents are trusting that we do our part. So they're going to have to do that, then come to school and trust that our safety protocols are in place. Um, you know, moving to classes will be different. Going to lunch will be different. Recess will look different. Gym's going to look different. Um, so, and it will vary grade level. So can't give you, a, like, I can go on forever about, you know, all the different grades. But uh, it, everything's going to be different, and kids are going to have to break old habits. They're going to be well, kids. They want to hang out. I get it. But. They're, they're, they're going to have to be careful. They get they got to they got to physically distance, like Ron said. Well, well, if I when I go to Boardman's local schools this coming fall, will the parents have to do the temperature check at home, or yes. will the school do it when they come in? No, well, I, obviously that's a great question. Some school, every school is doing it differently. Uh, we believe that uh, you know we got to put faith and trust in parents, and that's a you know that's a parent responsibility. Uh, we personally believe, and I, I'm not critiquing any school that's doing it. I don't know if Ron's checking them at the door, but I worry about checking the doors too late. That kid, that kid already made close contacts, and now we got to get them home. You know, um, so the parents got to do their part. No, no plan's perfect, but uh, that's where the parent trust comes in. Before they put them on a the bus, you know, check them out. If, if, if they're if they're showing those symptoms, keep them home. Will masks be required in the classroom and in the school? Absolutely, it, we hadn't required before the state did. We were going K through 12, but we know that's going to be tough. But we, you know, we asked our teachers to build into their instructional design breaks when appropriate and uh, socially distant appropriate. Um, but uh, yeah, you know, it's we cannot put desks six feet apart in every classroom, but we can get them three three feet apart. We can get kids in masks or face shields or both, and we can get plexiglass on desks. Mm -hmm. And so we're comfortable with uh, a minimum of three to a maximum of six. Now, we are you recommending? Are you recommending what types of masks they're wearing? At this time, you know, we'll, we'll follow the, the, the governor's guidance. They, they should have a cloth mask, but we will at this time, and unless there's some mandate that, that, that trumps what we believe, uh, we will allow face shields too, or both. <laughs> uh, but our teachers definitely. Uh, we have teachers that need to teach phonics, and, they, and, and young students need to see facial structures, read emotion. Uh, I, I know a lot of our, our staff will, pro, will, will go with the face. We've ordered 600 face shields for staff. So uh, they'll go with face shields, and some may go face shields and mask. So okay, and the children and the children will basically be responsible for getting those masks to come to school. If right. a kid doesn't have one, you'll be, probably be happy to give them uh, one just to go through the day. Right? Yeah, we'll we'll, we'll be reasonable. You know, uh, we get it. We we ordered twenty five thousand masks, so we have them on hand. Uh, but kids are going to, they're not going to want the, uh, the, 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 like the blue cloth ones. Of course, the, you know, people want to ex express their individuality. They're gonna, probably going to have, I don't know, hopefully a lot of Spartan ones. So. Well, I, actually it was funny. I was reading an article. I can't remember where I read it. A school actually ordered, I think like 3000, uh, cloths with the kids low, with the, um, school logo, school logo nice. on it to, the first day, everyone gets one. That they'll yeah. give you one. That's yours. Um, they'll expect you to wear it. Um, how will bus uh, and and out in now, Ron? Talk to me about what you guys are planning. Are you guys kind of similar to Boardman? Or are you guys kind of different? You checking them at the door or? Yeah, you know, we we spent a lot of time uh, talking about that daily assessment because that's one of the protocols that we you know both for staff and students. Right. And, you know, some, you know, we, we work with actually we have a, a Whirlpool factory here in Marion that, you know, went through this this whole time and, and had to put some same safety protocols. And they so we work with them on, you know, how they brought their employees in with uh, those daily assessments. But it's interesting, again, how things change. So today, uh, again, in a conversation with my health department, if you read some updates from the CDC specifically related to kids, you know, they're not. You can't be you can't be just focused on temperature, because you know a fever is only about you know what they found especially with kids is only about twenty percent of kids actually have a fever as a symptom that have been diagnosed with COVID. So one of the concerns that they have now is you know just because you take a kid's temperature when they come in and it's allergy season, you know you're sending that kid home who's not 
uh, who's not, you know, has not, not the same symptoms as COVID and, and, and those kinds of things. So, you know, again, that just came out today. But we spent the last, you know, <laughs> one figuring out exactly how we were going to do the daily assessments as well. We went back and forth. I mean, we were we were this close to spending about ten thousand dollars per school on infrared scanners, so that when we could get kids in and out fast, and it would recognize body temperatures and those kinds of things. And, I mean, we landed on the idea that you know we have a we have a form, we have a big pad that every kid's going to get, and every day on that pad is a checklist that they that families have to go through. You know, do you have symptoms? Do you, have you been in contact with somebody who has symptoms? How do you feel? You know those kinds of things. So and they'll have to bring that that you know that that form in with them every day. Um, but you know, I mean, we you know we, we honestly I mean, we have problems getting kids to turn in you know their signed report cards. So it's true. Uh, <laughs> You know, you can't always count on that either. And so we're going to have a method of, of kids with, with that don't come in with that form because we, we have to track, you know, to make sure that kids are uh, not displaying any symptoms and, and we have to nip it in the bud as soon as they come through the door. So, uh, you know, a lot of school systems have had that conversation lately about about how to do that. But, you know, and again, we're so we're opening up with this hybrid model, which, again, is a lot different for our staff as well. I mean, you think about it, you're, you know, you're. You're designing your lessons for Monday and Tuesday. In the meantime, you're designing lessons for those kids who are remote, you know, during that time period. And then you're switching. So you're, you know, you're still teaching that, but you have to be aware of, you know, what kids and how kids are progressing while they're at home and being remote. So, you know, the hybrid model, again, presents something that, that our staff isn't really used to. And, and that's another reason why we pushed our start date back was to give those teachers an opportunity to really plan for that as well. What does that look like on a weekly basis? And how are you, you know, how are you determining what to teach and, and how to monitor what to teach? Right. And, and what could, and what are some of the things that people will see once they walk in your buildings that would be changed from last year? Well, for us, less kids, for sure. <laughs> um, you know, because only 50%, and, you know, that that's, you know, we, we've talked to our staff. We had new teachers in today, and yesterday so it was our new teacher orientation and we talked today about an opportunity really to, to think differently about how we traditionally teach i mean you, you know you really have an opportunity to personalize some of the learning uh to really build some relationships with kids because there's less students you know in a class at one time so we're trying to highlight some of those areas to be really positive and take advantage of the situation um, and so that's going to be a lot different from us. But, you know, just like Tim said, I mean, we still, even though we're hybrid, we still, you know, can't do lunch the same way we do. And, you know, we got we got lines in the hallways and kids are going to walk down the hallways in a direction where they're used to congregating in a kid's locker. And, you know, teachers are always, uh, let's go, move, move, move. I mean, we have to be really deliberate about that, now, you know, and making sure that kids are following the protocol. And my advice, and you asked about my advice to families. We, we, our families have got to start talking to our kids about these protocols and making sure that they follow them and how important it is to do that. I mean, we're not only talking about the, the safety of our students, but our staff as well. We have 700 plus employees in Marion City that we have to be concerned about. And a lot of our employees are in that, you know, very vulnerable age bracket and, you know, whether they have conditions and all those kinds of things. So not only are we really concerned about our kids and their community, but our staff members are at risk as well. All right. Now, let me, I'll ask you the exact same question I asked Tim. Are you guys requiring masks mm. for your students and staff when they come in? And we, you know, three days before the mask requirement, we also passed our plan that required all, all of our students to have masks. And we, we are actually supplying those masks for our kids. They'll get two cloth masks uh, and a face shield. Uh, our teachers will have that opportunity to have both. But then, you know, again, I don't, we, you know, we just got some help from FEMA who delivered another 20,000 surgical masks to us. So we have about 100,000 masks right now that, that uh, we have access to. But the cloth masks we had, you know, they have the MH logo, <laughs> MH logo on them. And, uh, and so, um, you know, they're pretty cool. And, and uh, but, but we'll also have those masks for our students who might uh, uh, forget to wear them and, uh, so we're, 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 I feel like we're prepared in that, that. Well, and I will, this, this is probably the biggest question I get that I've been talking to superintendents, parents is the busing situation. That is probably one of the very biggest challenges right now, because normally you got 30, maybe 30, 35, 22 mm -hmm. seats. 
22 seats usually in a in a bus seats, two yeah. at each yeah. two so yeah. how and who, anyone can jump in how are you doing that i, I know you're looking at 50 percent um ron you talked about a b monday tuesday and then thursday friday and then tim was talking a little bit about um five day or in day learning and, and some different stuff so anyone want to jump in and how do you guys plan on um kind of a solution for buses because i know you guys don't have a thousand buses out there and a thousand drivers to pick up five no, kids per bus no, no you're absolutely right I, you know right now uh you know, like I said, we probably have 26, 27 percent of our kids that have chosen remote learning. So that has reduced your ridership. Um, of the parents that have chosen the in-person uh, model, uh, next week we're going to send a form out for them to declare if they want busing or not. You know, my prediction is, you know, probably that the the, the rate of bus ridership is going to drop just because of the nature of it. So not only we're not going to transport that 27 percent. Probably fifty percent of the seventy-three uh, percent will, will choose to. A lot of kids already, parents already take that more so than ever. So our, our game plan is obviously two kids per seat, mass required, assigned seats, uh, windows open, winter, you know, weather permitting. Um, and so if there is any uh, any type of a uh, of a breakout, uh, we can do contact tracing. You have to sit with the family member if they're present on the bus. Uh, and, and we're talking about the fill. You fill it back to front so that you pass less students. So we're taking a look at that also. We're not setting stone in the back to front. We do like to have some of the younger kids up front. But uh, but right now, that's the game plan on paper. Ron? Yeah, I tell you, you know, that, that was a, a real concern of mine. I mean, we, you know, the, at times, I mean, we, we only have eight and a half square miles here in Marion City. So, you know, our, our bus routes are kind of compact and we, you know, Prior to COVID, we put as many kids on the bus and still meet the safety requirements as possible. And sometimes the young kids were three, you know, three kids per seat. And so, you know, you think about that. I mean, we had 70 kids riding a bus at some point in, you know, some little uh, confined spaces. I, I was really concerned about, you know, us going back full on face to face and what that might look like at that point. But I agree with Tim. I mean, now, you know, that we're, you know, we're in the hybrid model. I think we're, we're going to be really good with, right. we've already done our, you know, surveying of our families and they had to fill out a Google form and, and we tracked all that about who's, and, and, and we're real confident right now that we're actually going to be, be able to meet that requirement of two to a seat uh, and, and be able to, to kind of space them out accordingly. But that was a real concern of mine going into this year was, you know, what are we going to do with those buses? Uh, I mean, really, it's, you know, you think about some small airplanes and, and you know, what they've tried to do with that. We, we could not do that. I mean, we, if we had, to, if we had to, to social distance on a bus when we were full on and we looked at the model, we, we would have been transporting kids all day long. Right. We, we would have had to bring a certain amount of kids in, you know, go pick up more kids, go pick in, and adjust the schedule accordingly. So, you know, <clears throat> yeah, I, I, was, I was really concerned about that. Um, and I still have a concern about that, you know, when we do go on, go back full on and, and, and we get back to some normal, you know, what requirements are still going to be left out there in regard to that. So, you know, we, we gotta, we gotta start thinking about those kinds of things as well. Well, and that brings up a, a great point is let's talk a little bit about what has happened kind of in the past and, and what's kind of protocols that you guys may have in place. And I'll, Tim, I'll go to you first. I know we talked briefly. It's been in the news. Um, one of your football players, uh, I think it was, it was it a football team? But yeah, a football player. Yeah, a football player uh, actually tested positive for COVID-19. And you guys ceased all um, practices at that time for that specific sport. Can you talk a little bit about what happened and, and what kind of the proto protocols that you have and what is – what was the solution to that? So we had a uh, one of our varsity football players tested positive over the weekend. Uh, he alerted the coach. So on Monday, uh, we canceled practice uh, just for football, uh, for the sport impacted. That allows – we contact the health department and we start working with them on contact tracing. So that allows the, the health department to do their job to find out if anyone's deemed a close contact. Close contact for, for any viewers is – means you're within six feet of, of the uh, confirmed individual for 15 minutes or more. It's consecutive minutes. That's a close contact. If you're deemed a close contact, now you're going to have to quarantine. Uh, 
So you allow the health department to do that. You need, you need the, uh, the confirmed case, uh, the individual to obviously cooperate, uh, and, and, and he did. Uh, but it takes a little time. So we allowed the uh, health department to finish that up. And then we allowed uh, an extra day for communication out to parents of the results. We were very fortunate um, that no other football players were deemed a close contact. You know, coach does a nice job practicing in pods so the, the kids aren't massed together. So if we were to have a breakout, it might only be six or eight kids. But even within those pods, the health department reviewed that. And these kids were not within uh, six feet for 15 minutes or more. So it was not necessary for any other uh, football athletes because of practice to quarantine. So we're only shut down for two days. We plan to resume practice on Wednesday. If you can't do that, you got to shut everything down for 14 days. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a big, big thing because we talked, Ron talked a little bit earlier about temperature. Just because I don't have a temperature doesn't mean I'm asymptomatic. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what people may not understand is you can still carry this without a temperature. Right. And, yep. and I think that goes to a, a great story that was out of Georgia. School district had to quarantine more than 900 students and staff because of possible exposure because of classes resumed last last week. That's huge just for a, just for a, high, a, a school to do that. So what kind of protocols and, and what kind of things have you kind of put in place, Ron, for your school to really respond to something. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, that's a major concern of ours is, um, you know, what, what happens when a student <clears throat> is diagnosed or a teacher is diagnosed or multiple students in a classroom and, and you know, how do we handle that? And <clears throat> again, I'll, I'll go back to the relationship we have with our public health department and they've been really, really good. I mean, they shared uh, with us the last few weeks, you know, they've developed some flow charts about what that looks like and who to contact and how they go about doing their contact tracing. Uh, we've really developed a really good partnership with them. We have liaisons for the health department. You know, when, when, when the health department's notified that someone has been diagnosed, we have a li liaison in each building and a liaison for the district. So that health department will contact them. They'll get the seating charts. They'll get all of the information that they need and we'll hand that over to them. We already have that process, you know, set in stone. Uh, and then they will make the recommendations on uh, who needs to be quarantined and for how long. They will also do the, the contacts for that. Now the school is aware of that and we have to, you know, do our part in making sure that we notify people who need to be notified. But you got to remember, we also have HIPAA and FERPA rights that, that kids have too, that we have to abide by. And so huge. So that, yeah. and, that, and that's the problem. Not, that's huge. Diagnosed with COVID today and, and, you know, we're shutting it down. That's not, that's not the way it works, um, and so we we follow those guidelines, and we have you know we have we have already established protocols for how we'll handle that situation uh, when the health department contacts us, and we will notify parents that you know there there has been a diagnosed case, but we are going to encourage them to uh, follow our health department's guidelines and the CDC guidelines on what quarantine looks like and for how long. And we you know we have to stick to that because our parents need to understand we can't kind of induce panic because one or two students or one teacher is diagnosed. I mean, you can almost guarantee that at some point in time it's going to happen uh, right. based on the, the, the data. So, um, you know, we're, we're trying to get that message out in a lot of our, uh, you know, the calls that we're making to parents and the infographics that we're putting up on our website, just about, you know, what contact tracing looks like and, and what to do and, and how the district will handle when you know either a student or, or a staff member's diagnosed well the from what i'm getting is you may have a good opportunity here because if you have that a and b group going monday and tuesday and you find out that it was that a and b group those kids can stay home for 14 days or staff member can, and so you kind of don't mix up the two groups and you may not get a big quarantine of more than 900 students like that it, it, would that be something that would would happen or would not happen. No, that and that that went that was part of our planning for hybrid. You know, when there are some districts who really thought at the beginning, you know, maybe group A goes on Monday and then group B goes on Tuesday, but you're missing like you want to keep those cohorts together and then, you know, because if you do that, you have to clean in between. And so if we have group A going on Monday and Tuesday, that helps with the cleaning, but it also helps with the contact tracing. So we, you know, we can pretty much keep those kids separate as much as possible. Um, and, and be able to, you know, to, to have good data. And, and really, we, we want to be able to supply our health department with as 
with as much information as we possibly can about who students and staff are in contact with. And Tim, what are what are some of the things that you would be protocol wise if something is found within your schools? Did I lose them? Uh, just a quick question: Is my am I losing some? No, am I losing you guys? No, you're good sure. now. It was just a just a snag. Did you get my question? You still have me? Yeah. Did you get my question? Yeah. Well, it may, my girls may have turned on Netflix all throughout the house, so I apologize. Um, I want to say something Ron, Ron had said. The tough part for us is we can't announce the, the, the student's name. You know, for that football player, we, we couldn't just – we couldn't tell – we can't announce who that is. Now, the kids figure it out. You know, <laughs> that, that's, that's up to them. That's perfect because parents are calling us, just announce who it is. We can't. I wish we could, yeah. but – uh, help, but we cannot do that. So, um, you know, they have to trust the process and it, it feels like uh, we lose a little credibility, but we're, we're, we can't do that. We cannot do that. So, um, but to go back to the protocols, really, I mean, that's what we're following those protocols, those, those, those contact tracing protocols. So, um, so you, you can have a controllable number of people who have to be quarantined. If, if you don't have, have separation and you don't have pods or, um, you don't have adequate spacing, um, yeah, then, then you're going to have situations where you're going to have to shut the whole building down. But if, if, if you can have controlled numbers, uh, assigned seats, assigned cafeteria seats, uh, so that the health department can call up that person and they can find quickly who a close contact would be, you could control the number of people who have to be quarantined. If you can't, you might have to shut down a whole building. Well, and, and I think that that's something that we want our kids to go back to school. I think that's everyone agrees. It's just how safely can we do it? And and I think one thing that we talked yes. a little bit of, a little bit about, Ron, is and I know um, I'm sorry to hear, but you're actually mom passed away from COVID in April. Yeah, back in April, you know. So yeah, the virus is kind of personal for me, and and it's uh, you know uh, I'm always kind of amazed by some of the conversations out there about this virus. But I can tell you that you know, my mom was. Uh, 81 years old and was doing really well uh, in, in her age and enjoying life. And uh, the night before Easter, I got a phone call that, you know, she had had some symptoms and they took her to the hospital. And you know, I was fortunate to, to have at least some conversations with her, but uh, it's been kind of surreal, you know, when typically if a loved one's, you know, sick or in the hospital, you get a chance to kind of be by their side and, and you know, be there and support for them, which my family was unable to do so. So my heart goes out to a lot of those families who've been affected by this. And more and more, you know, I, I'm learning of, of people that I know who have family members. And again, you know, so I, I mean, I, I talked to my community about that early on, you know, back in the spring, because I think people need to know that, you know, people you know have been affected by by this virus. And so, you know, that the, the concern for us is real. And it's, it's you know, we want to protect our students and we want to protect their families and we want to protect our staff and at the same time we know that you know uh, we have to be able to provide them with the education that they need and again i'll go back to saying for some of our students schools to safe a very safe environment for them uh we we in the spring we probably um it's probably about 300 of our students that we completely lost contact with and you know we did everything we could. Uh, in some cases, we even had to call children's services in and, and make sure that those kids were protected and safe because that's our responsibility to do so. Um, and so, you know, we're trying to balance that, right, to keep keep our kids safe from COVID, but also keep them in a safe environment where they feel comfortable uh, every day. So, you know, again, it's had a personal effect on me. Um, and, and all that does for me is kind of put things into perspective when I start thinking about, you know, prioritizing uh, what's important. And that brings up a good point is there's just not to just teaching. There's livelihood of students that we got to find and, and students that we, that we love and take care of. And let me ask you this. We probably, uh, we have quite a bit of people watching and we have parents and we may have students. What, and I'll go to Ron, I'll go to you first is what, what can you tell, what message do you want to give these students and, and staff and students? What advice can you give them or just in general a message? You know, we, we've, our, our district has really kind of put together a, a campaign, if you will, 
along with some of our community partners and, and some of the other school districts in Marion County. There's only five school districts in Marion County. So we, you know, we get a chance to get together on a regular basis. You know, but our message to our community is, you know, let, let's follow the protocols. Let's wear our masks. Let's wash our hands. Let's try to avoid mass gatherings and, and you know, th those types of things. If we want our kids in, in school uh, and we want to, you know, kind of get through this, that we all have to do our part. And so we have billboards that are going up about that. We've, you know, started this campaign uh, amongst the, the, the local radio stations. And so, our, you know, our advice to uh, all of our families is to really take this serious, to do what they need to do. Uh, and so that we can, you know, reverse these trends and continue to see downward trends in cases. And, you know, the, there's enough research out there that says, you know, if the virus is not spreading as much in your community, it's safer to go back to school. <laughs> so, you know, the more we can reduce the spread of the virus in our community, the better chance we have of getting our kids what they need on a daily basis. So that's, that's my advice is pay attention to what's going on. Make sure you wear your mask, wash your hands avoid, uh, you know, mass gatherings. And if you're sick, stay home. Tim, same question to you. It's going to be hard, uh, it's gonna be hard to, to not copy what Ron said, obviously, because uh, that, that that's huge. But uh, I would add to that uh, we all have to have patience with each other. Uh, things are changing so rapidly. You know, one thing we say on Monday, we may have to change that because of conditions that have changed or mandates that have changed. So, um, I just ask parents to be patient with us. We're patient with them. Um, and uh, to, to be prepared to be flexible. Uh, I think Ron has said it a couple times. You know, he has hybrid. He's not married to it. Uh, he's ready to switch. And we're the same way. We got a five-person, uh, five-day in-person. We may have to go to a hybrid. We may have to go to 100% remote. Uh, we, we, you know, that, that may happen and it may happen quickly. And uh, do we want that? No. We want to give as much lead time. Um, I feel for parents. Uh, my kids uh, graduated, uh, my, my youngest just, just graduated two years ago. Uh, I think I'm a much better uh, administrator uh, mm -hmm. after being a parent. You know, you, 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 feel, you feel in your hearts. I get it. You know, uh, I, I get it. Uh, a lot of the decisions we make are really inconveniencing parents, and we wouldn't make them if, if we didn't believe that they were for safety. So I'm uh, just asking parents to be flexible, be patient. Um, you know, our priorities are, number one, our safety for students and staff. And uh, number two is, is, is to give uh, an outstanding education that our community expects. And we've learned lessons from the spring. So remote learning is not going to be the spring remote learning. Like Ron said, we, we, we built that in two days and kept building it. And a lot of people just thought it was an experiment for a couple months and then we'd be back to normal. <laughs> we've learned that lesson. You know, I think we all have to quit thinking about two, three month chunks at a time. Although that's sometimes that's, all the further we feel like we can see ahead, we got to start thinking eight, nine, 10, 12 months, a year plan, um, because we're not going to come back after Christmas break and the switch is turned off. You know, I mean, it, it's going to take a little bit. You got to be realistic. Uh, so we got to think long term and just work together and uh, make sure that uh, we're, we're building a, an educational experience, no matter what parents choose, that's authentic, that's challenging but is able to, uh, every kid's able to access that, whatever their challenges are. Um, and that, uh, and Ron, I love what you said because we felt here at Boardman, I know uh, I know our staff and our, and, uh, and our principals were calling hundreds of kids a day to connect. None of us want that. I mean, our teachers want to be in front of these kids. There's, I think we all learned the power of, of a teacher when we went to remote learning. You know, everyone thought remote learning would be the end all. Well, it serves a purpose, but there is power in human connection. And that's what te the power of teaching is all about, connecting to each other face to face. And uh, the quicker we can get back to that, it's good for all of us. But we may have to we have to realize this this is the way it is for now, but this isn't going to be the way it's going to be forever. So there will be an end to this. It may not be December, but we just, you know, we, we've got to we, we'll get through this. Uh, let us adjust, be flexible. Um, we're going to make this through. And the, the last question I have, does this pandemic change the way we teach our kids in the future? Oh. Any, anyone can answer that question. Uh, well, I, you know, we only want to be on, on, be history makers, you know, mm -hmm. be in the history books or, or be on the cutting edge. And I, I, I've said to, to ourselves, we are. Here mm -hmm. we are. We're on the cutting edge. You have a choice. You can look over the edge and be scared to death and back away. Or you can start to build along that edge 
and start to push that edge a little further and, and build. I, I think, yes, there's a lot of valuable lessons. If we ignore them, shame on us. This could really transform education for the good. I still believe you need the people piece. I think that's proven. Education is about people, and it will always be about people. But we found, I've found myself that I don't necessarily have to have to be locked in my office from eight to four in meetings. I, I can do a meeting from Zoom on a back deck and be just as effective. You know, like what I mean? you're doing right now. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, so you know, flip classrooms. Uh, you know, projects outside the classroom. I think we got to start looking at that. That could really evolve education and make it make it so much better. If we just quickly go back to the seven period day, fifty two minutes, um, shame on us. But I, I think we we could, it definitely can evolve. Ron, yeah, I, I you know Tim Tim really did a good job answering that question. I mean, I, I really think that you know we we've talked to our staff about taking advantage of this time too and to learn from. You know this time to, to really uh, you know when you talk about integrating technology uh, in, into a child's education I mean what better opportunity do we have right now to be able to do that I mean our kids you know most of our kids you know we, we consider them we call them digital natives and many of us old-timers are digital immigrants you know like we're really just kind of I'm in the middle out. yeah I mean we're probably somewhere in the middle but um, you know, our kids are pretty savvy with uh, their use of technology and what they can do. And, and we're, we're starting to find out that we can give our kids the opportunities to go explore and learn, you know, kind of learn self-paced and, and some self-directed learning, which is probably, uh, you know, some of the best ways that kids learn is by doing that. You know, inquiry learning is, is shown to be a really effective uh, method of, of kids learning. And so, you know, we, we have the opportunity to allow our kids to explore uh, and and use that technology to, to 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 teach themselves and and we become more facilitators in their learning process, which we all know is a is also a good strategy for teaching. So yeah, we're we're trying to take as many advantages of that, and I think too we will come out of this with uh, especially our younger teachers are going to have a a different understanding of um, you know what some of the best method, methods to teach our kids are. Those are some great points. Well, I appreciate you guys taking your time. You guys up for a little Q&A? I have some people that have submitted some questions. Sure. So I'm going to put it up on the screen, but I'll also say this one is from Nick. Oh, why couldn't we have this one? Will students have the opportunity to play sports in the fall? <laughs> we knew someone was probably going to ask that. Um, anyone want a shot at that question? You know, I, I was I was uh, concerned for a long time. I mean, you know, Tim and I are both uh, coaches, and and you know, we we both had children who participated in athletics, and I couldn't imagine, you know, my my kids not being able to participate in a, in athletics. And so, I think every school district out there really is striving to make sure we provide those kinds of opportunities, not just athletics, but a lot of the other extracurricular and co-curricular activities as well. Um, I was, um, I guess. Um, I felt a little bit better even after today, after looking at that chart to see how many districts are actually going back full on and how well some counties are doing. I feel better about that. Uh, I, I'm still concerned about, you know, we don't know how this virus is going to react when we actually do get kids back in school and if we're going to have to shut down. But uh, I'm confident that, that uh, you know, we're at some level, our kids are going to be able to participate in sport. They're probably not going to look the same. I mean, we we may have you know five game seasons or whatever. I told our coaches, you know, we get I don't care. We get two games in, and that, that's all it takes. You know, that's all we're able to do to give our kids that experience. We're going to go forward with trying to do that. Tim, boy, it's uh, I, I, like Ron said. Uh, you know, I have a lot of coaching in my background. Uh, I'm a big believer in sports. Um, I, as much as anyone else, I, I, this is my 33rd year in education. I've, I think uh, I've been to, between coaching and administration, uh, 340 uh, Friday night football games in a row. I've never missed one. And uh, <laughs> that streak may be in danger. Um, not, you know, just, I've never missed <laughs> the schedule. I, I don't know. I just, uh, I was really, I really want to see what the Big Ten was doing because I do believe that has an impact in Midwest Ohio. Uh, the Big Ten, to me, was kind of a domino, whether or not the, the Ohio High School. I mean, it's out of our control. I guess we could shut it down. I think I'd rely on the Ohio High School Athletic Association. They, uh, they're the ones that are leaders in that. I, I rely on their judgment to, to give us direction on what we need to do with that. And uh, I'm 50-50 right now. Well, I know just for the record that 
the Big Ten has canceled their fall sports, including football, which not many people are very happy. I think no. the Pac-10 followed and said that they are now canceling their season. Right. So now you have the ACC, the SEC still waiting for an announcement, which now you're talking about moving sports to, fall, to the spring semester, or mm-hmm. I should say spring sports. Um, if Here's a question for you. If you guys have 100% online learning, do you have any sports at all? I mean, I don't see that. Ha- I mean, if, if we're in a situation where cases are, you know, at that point where the county health department comes in and says, you know, you, you have to go remote or if that happens statewide again, you know, just like we've experienced in the spring, if that's the case where these, you know, the, the spread is on the rise, uh, I, I, I can't see that happening. Um, but again, I think what's, what, you know, what's, what's happened across the state is, you know, again, you know, Columbiana County or Morrow County may not be the same as Mahoning and Marion County. And so, um, you know, if there's an opportunity in those counties, again, where kids can play, I think we should let them play. I, I really do. I mean, it's, it's, it's unfortunate that we can't really have equity, but I mean, you know, if, if we're worried about winning a state championship this year, uh, I think our priorities probably need to change in relation to that. I mean, if we can get on the field, like I said, for a couple games or get on the court, you know, for a couple games, whatever that might look like, I mean, we we really need to strive towards those kinds of things and maybe change our perspective on that. Tim? The tough part is you, you do see programs when they have an outbreak uh, shut down for 14 days, and that's my fear. You know, you get to game one and you have a rivalry game coming and, and the other team shuts down for 14 days and you're far. I don't know. It's that that's the part that you get into the details and you see what it actually looks like. Um, so, but it's uh, it, you asked about remote learning. So I want to make sure you answer the question. I, I don't see how you could say we got to shut down schools and go to remote learning, but we can have sports. I get it. People want to have sports. I get it. It's a passion. It's a passion in America. It's a passion. I know around here, especially for Friday night football and marching band, you know, make sure you uh, put a plug out there. Our marching band's phenomenal. I'll miss that just as much. Love, love the half times of what Tom or Jerry does, but uh, that's a, that's a bad message. We can't have school, but we can have sports. I, I don't know. I, I, that's a bad message we're sending the kids. And here's a here's a yes or no answer. And I'll go to you, Tim. How much does your football income support most of your sports and or extracurricular activities? He said it's yes or no. So yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna tell you, we have some great gates. We 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 play uh we play Canfield, we play Urson, we we play uh, Mooney, we play Austin Town. People come to those. We fill that stadium. Mm-hmm. They're phenomenal gates, absolutely. So uh, that that helps our whole athletic program. And uh, you know, even if you have the season, you're not gonna have those gates. It's 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 tough. Ron, yeah, same thing. I mean, we we've already had conversations about how we can subsidize the athletic programs because we're not gonna get the same kind of revenue. Uh, that we bring in to help support those other programs. And so, you know, yeah, definitely a concern of ours is, you know, football for the most part uh, brings in a lot of the, the the revenue to help support even the spring sports. And so we're going to be faced with that, you know, should we uh, get to the point where we can open up again. But, um, you know, so we're, we're talking about how we can, how we can subsidize those to make sure it happens. Yeah. That, that, those are two big issues that you have almost one or two sports that support the rest of the athletic department. Absolutely. So, uh, and actually, I'll, there's a, a gentleman um, who actually asked a question. I'll just from Jim. He says, "Are fans allowed?" So, if they have football, I think right now it's a six season, six game season. Right. Uh, so, are fans allowed? What's the what's the rule? That's a, you know, that's a good question. I, I thought that right, as of right now, the high, high school athletic system said no. I thought is is what they're saying. Because we've been talking with, uh, we have a phenomenal uh, TV studio. Our, our kids, I um, mean, it's just fantastic. I call them our, our, our mathletes. They're they're up. Uh, they do all our replay. They do our whole video board. It's all all student run with the teacher. So I mean, we're we're gearing up to, to live stream to make sure people can see games. Because I I was under the impression, maybe wrong, that as of now, spectators are not allowed. Yeah, you know the, the the order that's come out, and it's not actually OHSAA's order, but it's, it's the Department of Health. Yeah, it's come out from the Department of Health around contact sports and those some of those that do not allow spectators. Now, you know the other there there, you know one of the issues that we deal with are some of the orders that are out are actually somewhat conflicting. 
So, you know, these club sports and those things that are happening right now, you know, the only requirement for spectators is that, is that they really social distance and you're really not supposed to sell tickets or anything like that. But if you've been to a, you know, a couple of these baseball games, I mean, there's, there are people there. And, and so I don't think OH, OHSAA has really taken kind of a stance on what that's going to look like. I mean, we've heard that there's discussions about, you know, at least allowing parents uh, to attend or maybe, you know, each student gets a certain amount of tickets or, you know, that you look at the capacity of your facility and then determine how many, how many tickets you can sell, but you still have to be, you know, you're still responsible for making sure that the, the health department uh, protocols and guidelines are in place. And people don't actually understand that as much as that, you know, if you're hosting an event, you are responsible for making sure that the people who attend that event are following the guidelines. You know, so when the health department comes in and issues a citation or anything like that, it's not going to actually be to the person. It's going to be to the facility to host the event. So you're responsible for that. So we have to keep that in, in mind and consideration. You know, I, I, I personally support the idea that we need to give at least our athletes the opportunity for their parents to be able to, to, to watch them perform. I mean, it, it breaks your heart that, you know, you can't see the student section on a Friday night and right. the Olympics that we have to control sometimes, which is actually somewhat fun. But, uh, um, yeah, uh, and I hope that that uh, that will be able to continue. Remembering the days that we went and were on the Friday night student section doing that. <laughs> So uh, we do a nice job with that stuff too. There. Yeah. Uh, next question is from Robin. Will students be required to stay in the same class in high school or are they still going to be changing classes throughout the day? That's a great question. It's, it, it, it is a great question and it's a great idea, but I will tell you at Borman high school, you, you can't do it. You know, we have such a diverse curriculum at the high school there, there's just no way. There's there's absolutely no way to keep kids uh, in classes together because of all the offerings we have. Yeah, I agree. With, I mean, we looked at that. You know, the poss we we've looked at you know the possibility of blocking schedules. So we only have instead of eight classes where students were you know changing classes, you know, bringing that down to four at that point. I mean, we you know I, I, you have to remember that you know um, our teachers also when when we make those kinds of changes. It's not like you can say to a teacher, hey, instead of teaching a 90 or a 45 minute class, now you're going to teach a 90 minute class and all those kinds of things. I and mean, you have to do some professional development right. with the staff in that. So it's not just as simple as making that decision that easily. Um, but, you know, we and, and, you know, we we may, again, have to continue to explore those options. I like what Tim said about patience, because, you know, as we nobody has the manual on a pandemic on how to operate schools on a during a pandemic. And we may have to make some of those changes as we progress throughout the year if we continue to see, you know, spikes in cases and outbreaks in certain situations. But, uh, you know, everybody, you know, has some of those good ideas. It's just a matter of, of what you can realistically implement as well. Yeah, I mean, that, that brings – I mean, you only have some people that will take an advanced course to a general course. So it's hard to, to substitute where they're going to go and how to keep them all in the same room. Uh, it's, it's it's just not possible. You can, you can do it the lower grades. K through three, yes. Four, five, six, we have teaming. Uh, so there'll be minimum. But once you hit seventh grade in our curriculum, you know, we have so many different offerings. We have different different flavors, whether it's advanced or college prep. That it just, it just it's, You can't do it anymore. Yeah, I, I can only imagine. I, I mean, it's just a, a lot going on. Uh, let's see. Next question. This one's from Chris. Are younger students going to be required to wear masks? It is hard for younger ones to wear it. That's a that's an yeah. interesting question. And the the um, pediatric association really has come out with some guidelines lately about masks. Um, and you know there was some thought at one point in time that maybe students second grade and under you know might struggle with with masks. I think that they're finding some success with younger students being able to wear masks. Again, that goes back to my recommendations and the information that we're getting out to our parents right now is, you know, parents and families have to work with their young students, the young children about how to wear a mask, how to keep it on, get it, get them acclimated to that. So you're not walking into school on the first day and, you know, wearing a mask for the first time and trying to navigate your way across that. But, but the answer to that is yes, our young, all of our students K actually pre-K through 12 will be required to wear a mask. 
we actually, uh, when we adopted our plan, uh, uh, the board gave blessing for K K through 12, and I know that wasn't popular. Um, and then, but then the governor came out a couple of days ago and supported it. So it's nice to have a little of that back in. And I want to uh, uh, add on to what Ron said. So uh, for the listeners who have who have young kids, maybe a, a first first time school age child at kindergarten. Uh, one of our teachers was talking about he has one. I thought this was a great idea. His son loves to play on the iPad. So when it's time to play on the iPad, you know, sometimes you have to restrict. What he does is you want to play on the iPad, you have to wear a mask. So the kids learn that we're, he can do fun things with a mask on, and he's teaching his kid to wear a mask and not tie it into a negative connotation. I thought that was so creative. You know, that, like Ron said, I think now's the time to get young kids used to wearing masks, not just when you're going to the store or going out and about, but just have them wear it throughout the day and kind of build up that 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 uh, that, that, that custom to it. And I, I think that's a great idea. Yeah, I mean, I think that just teaching them early what's what's going on, kind of getting them in the in the notion of hey, when you go to school, you're going to have to wear this mask all day long. Yeah, don't be break. I mean, obviously, it's not going to be you know seven straight hours of that mask. Uh, nobody wants to do that. So, you know, when, when, when there are appropriate times, especially the younger they are, uh, to find uh, opportunities we call mass breaks. So there will be opportunities for that. Well, I have one more question, and I'm putting it up on this on right now. This one is from Larry. Will the water fountains be operational? <laughs> oh, I'm laughing because, like, <laughs> we're talking about when you, when you make plans. Also, when you start to put them into action, you're like water fountains. You know, you're not you pass them all day. You don't you don't think about how they impact. That's a great question. Ours ours the classic water fountain where everyone goes to will be shut down. But we've been uh, fortunate enough to get grants to do the the bottle filler type. Mm -hmm. uh, we've been installing more and more of those, and that's some of the spending we're going to do. The, the buildings that don't have any or don't have enough, we're trying to add the, the, bottle, the bottle filler type, the no-touch ones, and, and we'll shut off the old classic fountain type. Ron? Yeah, I, actually, we are, uh, along with the two masks and a shield, all of our kids will get a water bottle, too. So we have uh, actually uh, um, transformed all of our fountains into the, you know, the – type that you just stick the bottle underneath there and they get refilled. You're really branding this year, Ron. That's good. <laughs> so you think about parents, I mean, instead of having to go to the, you know, Target or Walmart to find the three ring binder and the, <laughs> exactly. and the index cards is going to be mass water bottles. <laughs> you know? well, and, I, and, I, and those are two very big things that students are going to need. And, and that's a good point for parents. They may not know that, that, Hey, there is no more water fountains in the schools anymore. It's you got to have a bottle. You got to have a mm -hmm. refillable bottle that you'll use every day, and that's what you're going to use from now until probably, probably till this ends or or moving forward. Yeah, you got to think whole year. Like I said, it, it, there's not going to be a switch. All of a sudden, we shut things off. I mean, I think that's misleading. You, you got to be thinking this is you know we'll be in this for a while. Like I said, but it, we'll get through it. It's not. It's it, it's it's temporary. It's for now, but not forever. Well, and, and you guys are I, you guys are ready to go for the fall and everything. Ron and Tim, it's always a pleasure. Thank you for taking time out of your busy schedules. You're always welcome on my podcast. Anytime to, to help and, and get the message out. Great being here. Appreciate it. Yeah, Anthony, it's good to see you again. I um, appreciate all the work you've done in the Valley uh, to support that through your foundation and all that work. I was always uh, very honored to be a part of some of those events you had and uh, and and thankful for the opportunity to spend time with uh, you and Tim tonight. I appreciate it. Thank you everyone for joining us tonight. Check out other podcasts, interviews, and videos at Anthony V. Spano. Mm -hmm.